All right, Patterson, are you ready? I uh, I think I'm ready. I, I, I feel suddenly alone, but that's okay. It's okay. We'll still be here. All right. Excellent. All right, here we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's Black Hills Information Security Webcast. My name is Jason Blanchard. I go by Banjo Crashland on the internet, and we appreciate you being here. Uh, today, we're doing a new webcast. Uh, we do this pretty much every single Thursday. And so if you want to join us next week, Kelly will be here. Uh, but we do this every single week for the most part. Uh, and so if this is your first time here, come on back. If you've been here hundreds of times, we appreciate you being here. Today, Patterson's going to give a webcast on rapid endpoint investigations with Velociraptor. I first heard about Velociraptor when we were putting the backdoors and breaches cards together. And I was like, what is this? And so if you've never heard of Velociraptor, Patterson would would tell you about it. Uh, and then if you have heard of it, uh, he's going to go into more detail about how to use it more effectively. Patterson, do you have any questions before we get started? Negative. All right. Last thing is, if you have questions at any time, feel free to ask them inside Zoom, or you could ask them inside Discord. We're going to keep track of both of those locations. If you ask in Discord, then it's possible that your fellow attendee will help answer your question and get it answered much faster than if you did it in Zoom. And the reason why we have Discord is because the webcast lasts for an hour, but Discord lasts for forever. And so if you want to keep the conversation going, then stick around in Discord and, and become a part of the community there. All right, Patterson, I'm going to go backstage. It's all yours. Excellent. Thank you, Jason. Thanks all uh, for being here today. I appreciate it. Uh, I have uh, I have a jam-packed hours worth of content for you, so looking forward to jumping right in. As Jason mentioned, rapid endpoint investigations with Velociraptor and Cape. You may note that the word Windows was in the uh, the title that went out describing this webcast, and, and point in fact, I removed it from this slide uh, because a, a lot of what we're going to talk about today will be OS agnostic, if you will. We will conclude today with a, a sort of a, a deep dive into Windows uh, artifacts and investigation, but I did want to highlight that uh, the, a lot of what we're going to talk about up to that point can be used uh, used elsewhere. I should also point out that I work, I, you know this already, I work with some very intelligent, uh, some very talented folk. And day before yesterday, uh, some of my team members asked if I was ready for my webcast, um, fully aware that this is my first BHIS webcast. And I, I bemoaned the only thing I'm missing, truthfully, is a Velociraptor wearing a cape. And naturally, being the folk that they are, um, they rush to my aid. And you will see the uh, the AI um, uh, handiwork uh, throughout the remainder of this presentation. So, so uh, call out to those fine folk. So, again, uh, uh, in an hour, uh, what can we get accomplished? So, we're going to do just a brief intro, and then <clears throat> from there, I want to talk to you about a a, a workflow, uh, just a high level framework for a rapid triage workflow. From there, we will dig into some specific technical components. We will talk about Velociraptor for artifact collection. Then we'll talk about CAPE for uh, post-processing. And then we'll talk about some, uh, some analysis. And I'll do a demo for you uh, at, at the conclusion. Rounding out, of course, this conversation with some, uh, some external references and my contact information, uh, should you have follow-up questions, thoughts, uh, uh, et cetera. I, uh, I don't know if anyone here is familiar or a fan of Grand Thumb, um, but uh, I, I like uh, Grand Thumb as a YouTube personality. And, uh, and whenever he does a series or session, he, he starts with a premise and then he shifts directly to, to credentialing. And, uh, and the reason that he does that is to say, you know, there are lots of opinions out there, are lots of approaches, lots of ideas. Why on earth should you listen to me? And that, that's, a, that's a valid question. I think it's imp an important question for you to ask. Uh, it will help you determine uh, the value of the content that is to follow. Uh, my, my name is Patterson Cake, and I am a digital forensics and incident response consultant for Black Hills Information Security. I have been doing DFIR um, specifically as a, as a career focus for the last three or four years. I've been in and around IT, InfoSec for a long time, tangentially engaged in incident response, but it has been effectively my day job for about the last three years to respond to enterprises in crisis. 
And you'll note uh, uh, that I have a little DF and a big IR under my name. And that is just, that's just who I am. That's my approach. I am much more excited and interested in the active incident response components. And uh, I'm not a digital forensics nerd. And I don't mean that as an insult. I love those people. I love having them on my team. I love working with them. But I am extremely interested and excited and passionate about actionable intelligence. So if you call me and or my team to come help you in the midst of incident response crisis, that, that's what excites me. And when you call me, frankly, usually you have three imminent questions. One is, how did this happen? How did the threat actor engage in our environment? Two is, where have they been? And three is, what have they done? Everything that follows, truthfully, is my effort to arrive at those answers quickly and accurately so that we can frame the situation and then we can move forward with the rest of the incident response process. So that's my perspective. That bookends everything we're going to talk about today. Again, laser focused on actionable intelligence in the midst of crisis. If you've been in the midst of crisis, I'm sure you're well aware that chaos often ensues. And, uh, and I'm fond of the notion, the phraseology, that complexity is the enemy of security. I really believe that to be true. So I work overtime to oversimplify as much as I possibly can. And this is my super high level oversimplified view of your entire world. And so when you engage with me and or my team, an active incident response, this is, this is where I start my perspective. And the attack surface portion on the right really is just all the things that matter to you from an IT perspective, all your systems, your data, your assets, your whole world, again, from an IT infosec perspective. The, uh, the point of impact for the rest of this conversation, again, we're going to assume that something bad happened. You don't engage with me and or my team. You don't engage your IR plan, et cetera, unless and until something happens. And so often my point of focus is the point of impact. What do you know about what happened, the bad things that happened? And so at the outset, can I draw on there easily? Yes, I can. The outset, I'm going to be laser focused right here, point of impact. You've had an alert. You've investigated the alert, it's transitioned to an event, potentially an incident in your environment, and that alert comes with a bunch of clues. It comes with context, date, time, username, process name, et cetera. So again, right out of the gate, in the context of your entire IT infrastructure, we're going to focus on initial point of impact. And then my goal throughout this process is going to be to help you identify the attack extents. And what I mean by that phraseology is I want to identify everywhere the threat actor has been and everything the threat actor has done. And if I do that and I do that well, it sets us up for success moving into containment, eradication, uh, remediation, recovery, et cetera etc. I have to work at it. And so that's why I kind of make a, a, a singular point out of this to remain focused on those goals. And then throughout this process, as we gain clues, insight indicators will adjust our perspective. We will continue to broaden our gaze, ultimately trying to find, again, the outermost extent of threat actor and or unauthorized changes in your environment. So this is where you find ourselves. We're, we're at the, the analysis slash containment phase. Truthfully, again, everything I just described, this is, this is preeminent to me. Once again, if we nail this part, if we nail the analysis and we can accurately identify everywhere the threat actor has been, everything the threat actor has done, the, re the remainder will be successful. So this is super, super critical. And this, again, is just an overarching sort of framework perspective just to help me keep on track. And we have the same general categories that we had just a minute ago, attack surface with the addition of indicators and capabilities. And attack surface is your world, the things you care about, broken down categorically for no other reason, honestly, than to switch to the next column, which are indicators. Where are we going to find threat actor behaviors, activity, actions in your environment? Memory, identity, network, and disk. Again, those are just loose constructs. They are, they're not technically discrete. And I put them there once again for me and potentially for you as a reminder, for example, 
if we are working, uh, uh, our initial alert is based on a running process, then we're probably staring at indicators in memory. We could then pivot from those indicators in memory. We know that everything that runs on a Windows operating system runs in the context of a user. So we might then pivot based on initial indicators in memory to identity, the account in question. We might then pivot to, were there any network related activities associated with the initial process? You get the idea. And then last but not least on the right hand side, we have your capabilities. These are the things that give us visibility into memory identity network and disk in your attack surface environment. And once again, this is where we start our adventure together. And if you will give me, if we can provide visibility into all these areas, into each of these attack surfaces, then we can and we will find the threat actor and what the threat actor has done. I'm fond of the idea that the, uh, that the threat actor is not a wizard and malware is not magic. If we can see into these components, we can indeed successfully accomplish this piece. And, uh, and the methodology that follows is born out of, uh, of a couple dozen uh, significant, significant active threat actor engagements over the last couple of years. <clears throat> given, uh, given the opportunity, uh, I'm a huge fan of live box forensics. If I can stand in front of an impacted system server, uh, to me, there are few more efficient ways to sleuth out what's occurring on that box, what the threat actor is doing and or has accomplished. That's not often practical. It's obviously tough to scale that, but I do find it incredibly effective, incredibly efficient. The other side of the spectrum is the dead box forensics, and this is the more sort of antiquated traditional perspective that I need to get a full disk image of every single impacted system. That will give me the greatest depth of visibility into all of the artifacts related to the operating system, the underlying operating system, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm trying to do and what the remainder of this conversation really focuses on is the idea of tactical forensics. And what I'm trying to accomplish is the best of both worlds, effectively, efficiently, and at scale. I want to do all the things that I need to do as quickly as possible one more time to ascertain where the threat actor has been and everything they've done. And there's a place for all of the above. And so my sweet spot truthfully is combining the best of both of these sort of scenarios and seeing if we can pull that off tactically and again at, at scale. Always, always, always looking for actionable intelligence again in the midst of crisis. Part of what follows is uh, is based on uh, budgetary cycles. Uh, go figure. The uh, uh, a few months ago, we were considering purchasing some additional tooling, and uh, and considering uh, forensic platforms, forensic investigative platforms. And so, I gathered uh, I gathered a list of five, six different solutions from FTK to Belkasoft to Xways to Axiom to Autopsy, a handful of others. And I created an incident. Um, I spun up a couple VMs, a couple Windows VMs. I attacked the one. Uh, I, uh, I simulated normal user behaviors. I simulated accessing webmail, downloading malicious PowerShell script, gaining command and control, pivoting through meterpreter, escalating privileges, then searching out sensitive data in the environment, archiving it, and exfiltrating it. I carefully documented everything that I did in that process, date, time, command, et cetera. And then I took a full disk image, a memory capture. And honestly, at that point, as sort of a side note, uh, use Velociraptor to create an offline collection. And then I stacked them up. I tested them against one another to see what we might learn, to see where we might want to invest potentially some money, some licensing. And this is the very high level of uh, outcome of that scenario. I'm a huge X-Ways fan. I'm a huge Axiom fan, honestly, as well. Uh, and, uh, and as you can see, just quickly, it's not important, the minutia on the screen just gives you some perspective. I started full disk image, again, uh, with five or six different solutions. And I was targeting about eight specific indicators based on the incident that I had created. And you'll see that, uh, that we basically have eight indicators from X-Ways and Axiom, not quite 
uh, not quite the verbosity through autop uh, autopsy, but uh, autopsy is hard to beat for the price uh, as compared to Axiom in particular, somewhat less so X-Ways. And sort of tangentially through this process, I realized that what if, what if I could acquire this level of visibility, this level of artifact extraction by using other tools like Velociraptor, potentially Velociraptor in conjunction with CAPE. And so here we are. If you've ever created a full forensic disk image of a system, even a small system, you know that just creating that image often takes a couple hours. Sometimes it can take significantly longer if you're working on a server or something like that, something with a large disk, uh, et cetera. Then after you acquire the forensic image, generally you have to validate the forensic image, and then you have to figure out a way to get that forensic image to your analysis systems. Often that's another couple hours, sometimes much longer to upload, transit from customer premise to your work environment. And then if that's not enough, you need to then take that image and ingest it into one of these tools. And to be conservative, that's often four, six, eight hours total from instantiation of image through ingestion, and you haven't even begun your analysis yet at that point. Again, six, eight hours, I think, is pretty conservative in my experience, even with a fair amount of horsepower. What I'm going to walk you through today using Velociraptor in conjunction with CAPE, as opposed to the six to eight hours, is going to take approximately six to eight minutes. And so we're going to use Velociraptor offline as our acquisition tool. We're going to use CAPE as our post-processing tool. And then I will show you the output and we will dig into some of those details again. And I'm being pretty conservative and realistic on those timeframes from six to eight hours down to six to eight minutes to begin our analysis. Now, forgive me, this is not apples to apples. I am not saying that there's no value in full disk imaging. I can absolutely acquire things through the uh, some of these other tools that are, are really hard to do with what we're going to talk about today. But remember, our focus today is rapid endpoint triage. Oh, and by the way, this is a fascinating exercise. I would strongly suggest that you do exactly this with any diagnostic tools, any forensic tools that you uh, are currently using and or hope to use. Very, very illuminating. So super high level workflow. Uh, seriously, we got one whole slide on my rapid triage workflow. I love the idea of triage and, and that specifically centers around the notion triage in that something bad has happened. We have limited resources and we need to figure out how to best utilize those resources for the desired outcomes. So that is my perspective. And again, I try and keep that in focus as we're moving into active incident response. I, uh, I did not put a Velociraptor on this one. I put my reminder to myself for my LPVO. And if you know what LPVO stands for without Googling it, we should probably be friends. The idea, again, is to help me to be dynamic in my perspective. We're going to zero in on point of impact, initial indicators, initial clues. We're going to extract those. We're going to look we're going to look for high fidelity indicators. And when we find high fidelity indicators, we are then going to back up broaden our zoom and we're going to go through that process iteratively we'll do that a bit in our demo first things first we're going to acquire artifacts we have to have a way to gather this data i want to point out and i meant to do it on a previous slide i want to point out if you have tooling already i think your highest priority is to learn to use the tooling you have if we get to the end of this exercise and or when you test your tooling, you find you need new tooling, then awesome. But priority one is not to run out and buy something different or down so download something new, in my humble opinion. Once we acquire the artifacts, we got to do something with them. Usually we need to parse them in some way, shape or form. Again, we're going to focus intensely initially on the point of impact. What started this conversation, alert, event, initial indicators. And as we do that, the next steps are going to increase our context. We need to gain a little bit larger perspective moving outward from our point of impact. From there, we're going to look for 
uh, uh, indicators of compromise. Sometimes I just like to call them clues, truthfully, because indicators of compromise immediately sounds negative. And somewhere in this process, we're looking for clues. We don't know necessarily that that IP address is evil. We're working to, to come to that conclusion. And again, when we identify high fidelity indicators, we're going to expand our context beyond our point of impact, looking for the attack extent, trying to come to the end of the threat actor interactions in your environment. Once we nail that, once we're confident of the attack extents, containment is easy. Containment is easy, relatively speaking, if we do the first part well. I love the, uh, the Jocko Willink quote on the bottom of this slide. <clears throat> this is born out of actual combat engagements, of course, far more intense than most things in this context. But the idea is just, just calm down, take in the information available to you, make a decision, take decisive action. That's, that's where we're headed. <clears throat> now we're going to shift our focus ever so slightly again from that uh, initial sort of methodology framework to a, a, an actual Windows system. We're going to pivot and, uh, and recognize that in terms of uh, attack surface for our scenario, we're looking at an endpoint, we're looking at a Windows endpoint, and so we have to make some decisions about our initial artifact collection. And uh, this is just a short list uh, of things that I want, uh, of what I believe to be high value triage components specifically for Windows. I absolutely want event logs, shock. I want MFT if at all possible. Given the opportunity again to find that sweet spot, the, the tactical forensics between live box and dead box forensics, if you can give me insight into what's happening network from a netstat, netstat with some detail, fantastic. Honestly, my favorite artifact, especially when it comes to live box forensics, is running process with command line. I don't think there's any quicker way to ascertain if evil is happening on an endpoint, a Windows endpoint in particular, than running process with command line. Auto runs is a fantastic compilation. It's a, a system internals component. Auto runs looks for uh, persistence locations primarily. A lot of the work has been done for me in querying those again from a triage perspective, consolidating and making it easy to ingest and review. If at all possible, I'd really like artifacts of execution. And, and what I mean by that are, can you tell me what things ran on that system? So we're, uh, we're thinking of things like shim cache, am cache, et cetera to just determine, did PowerShell execute? Did cmd.exe execute? Last and definitely not least, especially if we're dealing with a Windows endpoint used by a standard user, desktop, laptop, web actions in history are significantly important. These are the things I want. And you'll notice, again, these would all, for the most part, be bundled up in a full disk image, definitely full disk image plus memory. But I want to see if we can tactically acquire those again through our pal Velociraptor and then do parsing with Cape. I think maybe I use Velociraptor oddly. Um, and that's part of the reason for this conversation is, uh, is I have sort of made it my own and, and I had specific goals in mind. And so uh, I'm not excited about spinning up infrastructure in response to active incident response. It's time consuming. It's costly. So I started using Velociraptor offline collector and offline collector just means that the Velociraptor agent is not directly communicating with a Velociraptor server. And so I'm gonna show you how, how we go about doing this momentarily. I'm looking to create a discrete executable that I can provide to you as my client or customer that you can use, you can detonate, you can execute on a Windows endpoint and collect the data for me that I need. No Velociraptor server required, no Velociraptor server communications required. Again, I'll show you how to do that in just a minute. Um, why, why would I do this? You know, CAPE can collect lots of collection options, uh, again, Two primary reasons that I have chosen to leverage Velociraptor like this. One, again, significantly is no infrastructure. I can create an offline collector for you in I don't know, two minutes. 
and secondarily, I've done this dozens and dozens and dozens, hundreds of times, and it works. Uh, it's tried and true. It works for me again. If you have other solutions to acquire these artifacts, sweet, go for it. I'm going to demonstrate how this might work, um, uh, um, obviously, moving into demo. I'll show you specifically. Um, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to download the Velociraptor executable. We're going to execute it uh, with GUI. We're going to uh, used a web interface to configure artifact selection because it's easy, quick, simple, and we're going to choose these artifacts, the Cape Triage package, NetStat enriched auto runs, and PS list. And then we'll see at the end of that collection creation process, we have two options. We uh, Well, we have several options, but I'm going to talk about two options. We can use this executable to acquire all of these forensic artifacts and then package them up into a zip file. And then we can manually move that across the network, USB, et cetera. Or one of my favorite ways to leverage this is to have that executable create the archive package and then automatically upload it to a pre-staged secured S3 bucket. And then I will be demonstrating how we then uh, work that information through EC2 uh, momentarily. Extremely powerful, extremely svelte. It's about a 56 megabyte package, as I recall. We can distribute that package via GPO. I've done this at scale across hundreds and hundreds of endpoints in, a, uh, in an enterprise organization. And, and again, <laughs> you can probably tell uh, I'm excited about it because, well, it works. <clears throat> I'm not going to belabor this point because this honestly has the technical components that we are going to need uh, when we go into configure and build the offline collector. The offline collector is something that you can pre-stage. If you like this idea, Velociraptor is free. You can go download that component. You can fire up the GUI. You can walk through this. You can pre-stage a collector that, uh, that uh, archives to zip. You can pre-stage a collector that uploads to S3. You can test it. You can try it. You can have it just sitting around waiting. Hopefully, you will never need it. But if you do, good to go. Save yourself five minutes. And obviously, you're going to want to familiar, uh, familiarize yourself with the process. So we're going to instantiate the executable. We're going to log into the web UI. We're going to configure these individual artifacts, Cape files, network, uh, excuse me, netstat enriched, PS list, auto runs, and away we go. A few configurable parameters. We're going to decide whether we want to do to zip file or to S3. There are other options. Uh, again, GCP, Azure, that kind of thing. We're going to grab that package. We're going to figure out where we want it, figure out how we're going to distribute it. And then we're going to execute it on any and every system where we want to collect these artifacts. We're going to run it as administrator. That's important. And then we have a compendium. We have a zip archive. It's either local and or S3 in our scenarios. And, and we're ready to move into the next portion of this conversation, which uh, is the, the parsing followed by analysis. Oh, incidentally, <clears throat> if you like this part and you don't want to move into using CAPE, for example, I've had tremendous uh, uh, tremendous success in using the output of the Velociraptor offline collector with other tools, Axiom in particular. Axiom does a fantastic job of ingesting this data, categorizing it, normalizing it. So again, you don't have to use this in conjunction with CAPE. I just find that CAPE is obviously accessible from a cost perspective and, and, and a popular alternative, but this works. Uh, all I'm doing at this point is gathering that triage data. You want to shift and use something else to analyze that data, more, uh, more power to you. I'm going to combine this again with CAPE. And, uh, and I'm also going to use the Invoke CAPE PowerShell uh, uh, script, which I will uh, I'll show you in detail momentarily. I'll provide you with links to this, uh, uh, incidentally, at the end of the conversation. And so we're going to have to bolster CAPE just a little bit. We're going to download CAPE. Uh, CAPE is free if you're using it, uh, not for profit, so to speak. I would strongly encourage you to invest in the platform and the tool. If you're in an enterprise and you're purchasing or you're going to use CAPE, uh, fund the project because it's extremely worthwhile. A ton of work, effort, utility goes into this tool. I'm a huge fan. The logo is not the greatest. Uh, <laughs> but other than that, 
And so we're going to step through using CAPE for the parsing piece. We've acquired our data via Velociraptor offline collector. We're going to feed it to CAPE, and we're going to use some scripting that I've created to make this scalable, as you'll see in just a minute. We're going to extend CAPE with some additional modules. They're going to have to go to a little bit of extra effort to download these components. I'll step you through that technically and provide you documentation for that process. And this is the compendium. Hindsight and Airsoft are both going to give us visibility into uh, the browser components. Super powerful, super useful. The next several app cache, P command, M cache parser, SB command are all uh, artifacts of execution. EVTX is, uh, is pretty obvious. That's uh, pulling our event logs from our Windows system. I'm gonna tweak that slightly so that it works a little more tactically, a little more svelte. I'm also going to leverage Hayabusa to do some automated analysis of EVTX. And last but not least, I'm going to extract file listing and look for some specific things in the MFT, the master file table. And again, I'm going to show you uh, how to do that. I'm going to show you a link to this, uh, the scripts that I'm going to use. And I just have to tell you, I'm sorry, warn you in advance, one of my favorite, one of the most powerful Forensic and investigative tools in my disposal is Excel. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge Excel fan. I know that might not be popular. There are alternatives, but I don't, I don't know how I would survive without it. So I'm going to work to have my script pour all of this stuff nicely and neatly into Excel for me. And, and uh, you'll see that in a minute. You don't have to use that, but uh, I like it. Okay, we're almost done with the theoretical, and then we're going to move into demonstrations here momentarily. Thank you for sticking with me. <clears throat> so our rapid triage workflow components, I just want to uh, give you a little insight into specifically how I approach this uh, technically, tactically. If I have the opportunity, I'm going to use Velociraptor offline with direct upload to S3. And if I've already got it in S3, then for multiple reasons, I'm a huge fan of EC2. So I'm going to create in advance a, an EC2 forensics DFIR workstation, if you will. Workstation, sorry, you know, Windows uh, 20, uh, Server 2022. This is not the time to be cheap, in my humble opinion. I'm going to go with at least a T2 extra large. I'm going to go to two, vol two data volumes. I'm going to do a 150-ish gigabyte OS volume. I'm going to stage all of my tooling and scripting there. And then I'm going to create a data volume. I'm going to store all of my case data in that volume. I'm going to purge and delete and recreate that volume for every new case that I work. And I make it big, one terabyte to two terabytes for IOPS. Uh, IOPS are directly proportionate to GP disk size partitions within EC2. I want it to be fast. And I find, honestly, that this combination is a pretty good ROI, pretty good bang for your buck. I'm going to stage Velociraptor, which of course we can again download from the Velocidex GitHub page. I'm going to stage CAPE. You're going to need to register to download that. I strongly, again, suggest you support the platform and product if you can. We're going to backfill with a couple additional executables, Hindsight, Nursoft, Hayabusa. We're going to acquire the Invoke CAPE script, which is provided by our pal Swisscom on GitHub as well. And then we're going to use a rapid triage script that I've created, which will uh, will ingest our VR offline data into CAPE and then spit out the results, some of it conglomerated into some Excel workbooks. And then I've also uh, created just a really simple expand archive script. I'll show you how that works in just a minute so that we can scale this. We're going to do a demo, of course, just with one machine for the sake of time. But, uh, but the idea is I can acquire Velociraptor offline collector at scale, 5, 10, 20, 100, if you will. I might go with a little bigger EC2 instance in that case. But this script would then allow us to cycle through all of those zip archives and, uh, and stage them for our analysis. Yeah, uh, I'm using Excel, as previously mentioned. I'm using PowerShell 7, whatever, 4. Dot, I don't know, um, latest, greatest. I'm using that specifically uh, for the expand archive component because uh, there are some long file names there and, and uh, old PowerShell Windows 5X doesn't deal well. And of course, I'm using S3 and I've, uh, I've gone so far as to pre-stage or give you a template for IAM uh, uh, privileges for securing access to that S3. I'll show you that in a minute. 
Heck, I guess I'll show you that right now. Bottom of the slide um, is the GitHub repo that I've created that holds the documentation and the, uh, and the aforementioned scripts that I've created with links to all of the other pieces and parts that are referenced on this slide. I will show you that again at the end, copy and paste into Discord, et cetera, but, uh, but don't feel like you have to do a mad dash to annotate all that. I've, I've tried to document it for you in a GitHub repo. Okay, again, we're, we're approaching the demo. <clears throat> this is important. You'll see it technically in just a minute as we look at the scripting that I've created. You don't, of course, have to do it this way, but you have to do it a way. And then you have to make the script match your way. And, and what I'm talking about is how you stage your data. So I, as mentioned in the previous slide, I will create an OS volume. And then I will stage my tools on the OS volume because I will use that OS volume repeatedly. Whereas the data volume is transient, uh, ephemeral for me based on a case. So I'll create a D, D volume that's a terabyte to two terabytes in size again for IOPS. I'll create a cases directory. I don't really know why I can't create a cases directory since there's going to be one case on there, but sorry, old habits die hard, I guess. And then I name the case something meaningful for me. We often do a date relative uh, context followed by a name or potentially a code name for a project. So 2023 TAC 08 TAC ABC would be the actual case name. And then under that, I'm going to create a triage data folder where I place my zip files that I've acquired through Velociraptor. And then I don't actually have to make the CAPE output directory, but you could should you want to. Uh, then that will be where our processed CAPE output files uh, reside. <clears throat> so this is just a reminder for me as I progress into this part. I, I've got to be honest, and uh, I work constantly, I work regularly to silence my inner nerd. There are times and places and cases where I get all excited about minutia, and I go down this raging down this rabbit trail based on some little clue or some little identifier, and I have to just back up and say, I'm here for a purpose, I'm here for a reason, so we're going to be laser focused again initially on our event context, and then we're going to be brutal about filtering out normal. You'll see what I mean by that in just a minute, but I'm going to try and hone in on the most valuable, highest fidelity components of our triage package through the workflow that we're about to take a look at. And I'm going to be constantly focusing on meaningful impact. And uh, again, I, I sort of picked on the DFIR nerds of the world a little bit ago. In all sincerity, I, I find those folks to be tremendously valued teammates. I have never had to stand in court and defend my analysis. That's never been part of my day job. So I don't get excited about the 16 different possible NTFS timestamps of any given component of the MFT. I just That's just not where my head goes. So we're going to look for things that are meaningful for our first stages of incident response. Again, the analysis moving into containment, everywhere the threat actor's been, everything the threat actor's done. At some point, we're going to circle back around and say, okay, what did they access in our environment? What sensitive data did they look at? Did they exfiltrate that data? But right now that is not top of mind for me in terms of rapid triage workflow. I mean it, we're almost almost to demo time, uh, which I'm a little frightened about live demo. Uh, I'm sure it'll be fine. I am going to step through the, 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 the scripted process and at least an introductory component of the analysis of the parse data. And this is just a high level idea. Again, given the opportunity, I'm a huge fan of running process with command line. That's probably where I start. I failed horribly when I created this initial demo and I forgot to gather this for workstation one. So I do not have that, um, but we'll work around it. We'll work without it because that's life. The next thing I might look at is Netstat Enrich because once again, this is a this is a picture of pretty active network potential indicators on the the endpoint in question. The next thing that I like, and I'll show you, is MFT uh, file listing analysis, and we're going to be very specific about this piece. We're going to look at particular file types based on our initial indicators, specifically date and time, 
Then from there, I'll probably go to EVTX. EVTX is voluminous, and so we're going to work really hard at consolidating and looking for high fidelity indicators. I don't really care about 4624s and 4625s right now. <gasps> I know, shocking. We'll come back to that. Uh, successful auth, unsuccessful auth, in case you're wondering. <clears throat> so now I'm frightened. All right. I made all the things bigger. Thank you, Jason. He's a, a good guy to have in your corner. It's probably still too small, but welcome to my EC2 instance. And boy, it was really tempting to actually script all this, record it, you know, make GIFs, PowerPoints. I, I didn't. So this is either going to work um, or you're going to forgive me because uh, uh, we're going to go we're going to go live. So this is my T2 extra large. Windows 2022 server pre-staged again. OS volume is going to be semi-permanent. I've got my tools staged yonder. And you know what's super annoying is that that just will not stay large no matter how hard I try. Oh, well, you get the idea. Not super important. 150 gig OS drive, uh, one terabyte data volume. This is where I'm going to stage my cases. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this, again, this is important. Um, we'll see this in just a minute. You need to decide how you want to approach this. And then depending on, uh, that looks large, is that large? There you go. You don't have to follow this format, this function, but we need to tell the script, obviously, where we're going to put our data. So I will create a cases folder. I will create a named case, in this case, 2023-0829 uh, ABC. Then I will stage my uh, my triage data. <clears throat> and here you go. I've pre-staged uh, workstation one and workstation two. Uh, and, and again, we're going to feed this path, these paths, this, this format information to our script in just a minute. Oh boy, that's a little noisy. Sorry, but uh, we're going to step through it. So bear with me. So uh, if you want to use expand archive, I've created an expand archive triage data script for you. And if you're doing one zip file, it's probably easier just to manually unzip it. If you're doing a whole bunch of zip files, then this is kind of slick. And basically what you're gonna do is point to your case name. You're going to make sure that this path is appropriate to your triage data. And if there's one, five, 20, whatever, then this will just cycle through, unzip them, create file folders for each of them like we see here. Not uh, not very fancy, not very lead, but utilitarian. Again, if I'm looking to do 10, 20, whatever. And of course, this is on the, the GitHub repo. This is the one you're going to need to use PowerShell 7 for, or it's not going to like you. <clears throat> this is tiny, but it doesn't matter for the moment. We're going to go to Velocidex uh, GitHub. We're going to grab the latest stable release of Velociraptor 7.0-4 uh, currently, or at least... Uh, moments ago. We're going to download that executable. I've staged it in my tools directory. I'm going to instantiate the executable using the GUI, and I hope it works because this is a live demo. <clears throat> and we're going to see how fast we can do this. This is all we need to do. We don't need infrastructure. I got it. Thanks. Go away. <clears throat> we're going to fire up Velociraptor. All we did literally is invoke the executable with the GUI switch. If you click on this little expand sidebar, we're going to go to server artifacts. Then we're going to go to the little air, uh, paper airplane looking icon, which is build offline collector. And this is where we're going to pick and choose the, uh, the collections that we want to acquire. So we can just start typing here, CAPE, for example. We just click on that and it adds that to our artifact sources. It can keep going, Netstat. I want Netstat enriched. PS list, <clears throat> Windows system PS list. Auto runs, system terminals auto runs. I've now selected all of those. We can go to configure parameters. We should see each of those in the list. If you missed one, you can go back, search, pick. We do need to configure this just a little. CAPE in particular, we're going to click on the configure option. I'm going to use the CAPE triage package. All I need to do is collect this. You want to stare at what's in this package. Well, there's the list. You can look at it later. Uh, Netstat enriched. I I don't know why this is here, um, but you need to change it. Pow, done. Well, then we don't actually need to 
correct or uh, configure any of the rest of them. So we're good to go. Cape file targets, which gives me the bulk of my artifacts. Netstat enriched, which gives me Netstat with user, command line, PID, et cetera. PS list gives me running process. Sys, uh, auto runs gives me all of the ASCs, the persistence mechanisms and locations. And this is all I need. This gets me 98, 99% of what I need for my tactical analysis. You've got some choices to make. I've documented all of this in the GitHub repo, so don't stress or strain over it. Basically, we have to decide, are you going to do a zip archive or something else? Zip archive is the easy button that just creates a local archive on the system where you execute it. I'm going to switch to CSV and JSON. If we are not deploying this via something like GPO, I like pause for prompt, then we execute we get to watch it run. We get to see the final outcome in the, uh, in the UI that pops up. And then we get to press enter when it's done. That way I know it finished. I see that it was successful. If you're doing it through GPO or something, obviously you do not want to check that. I will often then truthfully get rid of this. I want the naming to be shorter. I know it's a collection. It will give me the fully qualified domain name for the host with date and timestamp. And launch. That's it. I'm done. Give it a few seconds. Click on this. Go to uploaded files. Click on the executable. Click through all of the warnings <laughs> that your browser gives you. No, I want it. I really want it. No, seriously. Um, let me keep it. Drops it into downloads. The next thing that I want you to do is rename it. Uh, it will be named the same thing. Um, and so you want to name it something meaningful. Uh, you know, VR offline collector, X64, whatever. Um, I'm a fan of some phraseology based on the contents of your collector. Um, but rename that. Otherwise, literally, it will just be repetitively named and you'll confuse yourself and everyone around you. We're done. That simple to create that initial connector. Then I provide that connector to you, provide it for download, provide it for execution. Again, GPO deployment, for example, we execute that as administrator on your Windows system. And this is what we get. Again, about a 56 meg package. I ran this on my EC2 instance just for kicks. Generally, I get somewhere around 200 to 300 megabytes. That can vary uh, uh, somewhat drastically depending on, upon the endpoint. The other day, I accidentally picked up a, a memory dump and got about a six gig <laughs> collector upload. I was pretty confused at the outset. so. Your mileage will vary. That's partly why I like S3 because S3, of course, is extensible. That's part one, super simple. Documented in GitHub. If you didn't catch all of that, we've created our collector. You can pre-stage your collector. You've got it sitting there just in case you need it. Test it, test it, test it. Test it on your local system, test it on a server, make sure it works. I have had really, really good luck with it unless and until I make a configuration error, which all the time, of course. <clears throat> Once I have that in place, one or many, then we return to our scripts. We can expand our archives. If we've got a dozen, this works nicely. Again, it creates a discrete folder for each collection unzipped. If you've just got one or two, probably easier just to... <laughs> Do you like Heisfeld triage? Why do you not notice that until you're right in the middle of demonstrating in front of hundreds of people? Um, that's a new word I make up, um, Cape Rapid Triage. Anyway, not important. Um, this is the script. You're going to acquire Cape, assuming that you're going to use this workflow. You're going to download Cape to your tools directory or wherever you'd like to put it. You are also going to acquire Invoke Cape from the Swiss uh, Hub, uh, Swiss Com GitHub repo linked in my GitHub page. You're going to make sure that all of these match how you decided to stage your data. You can do it however you want, but this is important, obviously, in terms of the, uh, the parsing of our data. We've staged our data. We've unzipped our data. We've edited these to map to our environment. And then we're going to have to do a little thought. You can run with my ideas should you want to. I challenge you. You're smarter. You know your environment better than I. Make this your own. Make it as specific to your current situation as possible. You have some context already. 
in my demo system, in my uh, workstation, my Windows 10 image, I simulated some normal user behavior, browsing documents, uh, browsing the network, et cetera. When I pull the EVTX, I get 71,000 entries. That's way too many for me to analyze right now. I need to shrink that number. Most of it's noise. 99% of it is noise. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use a slightly tweaked EVTX module for CAPE. I'll show you that in just a second. I'm going to define a start date, and this will parse out, filter out all of the events that occurred on this date or after. Our incident occurred on 8-2. Uh, so I went a day ahead and said, I don't care about three weeks ago. I don't care about four months ago. I care about yesterday or the day before or the day before. This is a hard choice. Make it. Make this decision. Look around. Make a call. A week a day, we can go back and change this. This is just for initial rapid triage. The next thing I'm gonna do is parse out events. I don't want all of them. I don't want all of them. Most of them are useless to me. These are some that I want. Documented again, in the GitHub repo with some explanation of what each of these are. These are things that are odd enough in your typical Windows deployment and environment that I want to know about them. How often is a service created on your Windows workstations? Not very often. How often is a new scheduled task created? Not very often. How often does someone log in? All the time. Yes, I know I lied. I actually included those there, but we're going to filter them out in just a minute. This gives me a consolidated, filtered, very, very succinct view of what I hope to be high fidelity indicators for my Windows system. And pukes those to a CSV file, which we will take a look at, of course, in Excel. This is the fun part. This will actually do the invocation of the CAPE modules. If you've used CAPE before, which you probably have, there's GCAPE. You can use this portion, this side of CAPE, if you will, to acquire this data. We already did that. We did that through another mechanism because I like Velociraptor. Feel free to use this, of course. This right-hand side are module definitions. These are the things that we can do to parse our triage data. Well, I got to hurry up and run out of time. Um, this, I have tweaked ever so slightly. I have made it available to you on the GitHub page. All I've done is create some variables so that we can filter some of this noise. The rest of these just cycle through the data that we've already fed CAPE one by one. It'll go folder by folder by folder. If you have station one, two, three, seven, you get the idea. At the end, it will roll up all of the data. No, it won't. It will roll up some of the data to Excel. We're gonna acquire this information. We're gonna stage our data. We're gonna adjust a few variables. Then we're gonna fire off the script. And if all goes right in the world, we're gonna get output files that look something like this. Cape output. And we're gonna get an individual set of three folders for each station that was in our triage data. And then we're gonna get a couple of compendium of Excel spreadsheets. Quick side note, the full artifacts are right here. You can drill down into the uh, the individual components that you extracted from Velociraptor if you need to dig deeper, go further, et cetera. The CAPE output is, is the parsed output, and this is where we're going to focus our efforts moving forward. The, the first place that I'm going to start is the conglomerated web and artifact of execution combined with parsed EBTX. It's going to look like I cheated. I guess I did. I, you know, obviously, I know what happened in this incident because I did it. But I did not massage this data. I did not alter this output. Let's make it bigger before Jason yells at me. <clears throat> so this is the output of my script. This is the one of the consolidated spreadsheets of output for my script. It has all the web artifacts. It has all the uh, execution artifacts. And it has all the EBTX artifacts that I have filtered for my, again, quick rapid triage. This one's awesome. The hindsight one, it was already pre-filtered. It's already color-coded. This is just where the spreadsheet instantiates. I might start here because I'm here. This is probably not where I would choose initially, but I'm here. So right out of the gate, I just love filtering. I am going to try my very best to isolate weirdness. So I'm here now. We might as well look around. Probably I want download and login. Uh, lots of other noise, but show me download and login. 
And again, yes, I'm cheating on one level. On another level, this is exactly what I would do in real life. And does this look concerning to anyone? The answer is, of course, yes. We see date and timestamp relative to our initial alert. We're obviously concerned that our users are potentially logging into personal webmail. And right out of the gate that quickly, I have some potential indicators. I got an IP address. I got a potential file name. And no joke, I'd probably get super leet and do it. Copy, paste, workbook, show me this file name, find all, and pivot from there based on initial indicators. I did not mean to actually switch sheets. Thank you, Excel. Back to the timeline. Again, I, I'm there, so I might start there. That would not be my philosophical approach, but I found myself there. I'm like, I got to look. This is a fantastic tool and program hindsight for the win. And then I'm going to start moving left. I can't help myself. Downloads view. I'm probably going to look there because, again, I did not stage this intentionally. I did not alter this data. This literally came as the singular incident of multiple potential uh, simulated user behaviors. And once again, just from that simple view, we got a potential malicious IP address, a potential malicious file name. I know that seems too easy. It probably is in real life because your users are more busy than I was in staging this data. So I'll often then shift left. Hayabusa is my friend, again, because it's done some automated analysis for me. I'm going to do the Excel things because that's what you do. I'm going to highlight the whole sheet. I'm going to filter. I'm going to sort by date. Thank you very much. Then the next thing I'm going to do is say info. I don't want info. Lame. No lows. No mediums. Give me highs and criticals. Zoom in. I just took that list from a couple thousand entries to how many do we have? 16 highs and criticals. And I'm extending context. I'm now looking again from my date and time point, And I'm thinking, oh man, this is not good. Service instantiation, does this look bad to you? Yes, it does. Anytime you see a lowercase randomized character string for a service name, you should freak out and probably call me once again. Copy paste. Find all of them. Pivot elsewhere. Once I've taken a look at the highs and criticals, I may very well go back and look at the mediums and the lows and the informationals. But right now I'm just, again, laser focused on tactical response. The next thing I will probably do is go to my EVTX triage page. This, These are the parsed EVTX logs that we pulled a minute ago. They're only for 8.1 moving forward. They're only the events that I selected specifically. There's still too many. Filter, sort by event time. Let's do time created. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I don't I don't want to see these. I, I want them there for now because I can come back and look at them. But too much noise. Seventy two thousand entries. Still a lot of noise. Service instantiation, defender alerts. Service instantiation, real-time protection disabled on Defender. Again, I went from 72,000 entries to five or six entries just with some simple, brutal, honestly, filtering. Do I want to go back and look at that stuff? Yeah, uh, I, I do. But right now I'm looking for tactical information, ideally to feed to other teammates, to other coworkers, say, here's a service name, here's an IP address, here's a file name, go to the SIM, go to your EDR, see if it's instantiated anywhere else. I'm almost done. Two whole minutes. I can make it. I want to look at this as well, really quickly. This is MFT file listing. This, oh, I lied. This is MFT file listing in, and then it is filtered specifically by extension, file extension. That is part of the, where is it? Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, I'm blind at the moment to my file extensions. Okay, so right here. What I'm saying is the MFT is enormous. It's chock full of goodness, but I don't want to see all of it. 
I just want to see executables, zip files, PowerShell files, DLLs, you name it, you decide, you can alter the script. And then we go again from uh, potentially hundreds of thousands of entries to discrete entries specific to those file types. I'm going to filter. I'm going to try and filter. I'm running out of time. Chase, it's going to make me shut up. I'm going to sort by time really quickly. Let's do modified because it's more fun. And then all the way into my list. And look at the goodness. Once again, another perspective on the compressed archive. Do I want to go there? Do I want to see that? I absolutely do. There's our original file, PowerShell, executable. Find attack extents. Win the day. Well, well done. Well, well done, Patterson. I'm exhausted. I know. I'm, sure, I'm sure you're all exhausted. Good job. No, they <laughs> didn't want you to stop. They were like, yeah. go for two hours. <laughs> hey, uh, so first of all, Patterson, fantastic job. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with the community. Thank you for coming to join us at Black Hills and doing what you do for us. We do have an incident response service. If you ever want to hire us, unfortunately, you find yourself in a situation where you need to hire us. Uh, we're there for you. Uh, we have IR retainers. Uh, that's not why we're doing this webcast. I uh, just wanted to make sure every once in a while people are like, why didn't you tell us that you have this service? And I'm like, I'm sorry. We suck at capitalism. My bad. All right. So Patterson, uh, we probably have some questions. So can you stick around for about 10 minutes or so? We can do some rapid fire questions. I could talk about this all day. So all right. yes, absolutely. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us for today's Black Hills Information Security webcast. I'm going to share my screen real quick. So Patterson, stop sharing your screen. I'm going to share Discord for one moment. And I'm just going to let everyone know, uh, if you are in the Discord server, if you're currently watching this webcast, let us know. Uh, so we're doing a Book It style type thing. If you are of a certain age, then you remember Book It from Pizza Hut when you were... Uh, when you were younger, if you read oh, 10 books yeah. and you got your teacher to sign off on it, you could take it to Pizza Hut and then they would give you a free personal pan pizza. Now we're doing something similar that if you engage in the chat uh, during our webcast, and I know some of you are like, but I can't use Discord at work. And like, mm -hmm. we'll figure out something about that. Uh, but if you are in Discord, uh, let us know that you're here by actually posting something, either a gift or something. So that way we knew you were here uh, just because you were here but you didn't do anything just same thing like book it you actually had to read the book or like say you read the book all right all right all right so with all that said thank you so much for joining us uh we're going to stick around for about 10 minutes of q a which means if you had a question that wasn't quite asked yet and i know that the chat is just going insane right now uh but we'll let that settle down in a minute but if you have a question inside zoom a couple things patterson you just released a blog that blog is available here in Discord. If you scroll all the way down the nav bar, get to the BHSI blogs, uh, you'll find Patterson's new blog and it just got released on, online. And so thank you for writing that and putting that out there. Your GitHub is fantastic. I've already gotten some compliments back for how the write-ups are and everything out there. So thanks for putting that out there. Can uh, I interrupt you for just a second? Yeah. I feel like we didn't get final thoughts from Patterson. Like yeah. Patterson, if you just sum up like the like one or two things, that, if they did learn nothing else, what, what can they... Like just final thoughts with Patterson Cake. Final thoughts. Yeah. Um, most important takeaway. Honestly, I I uh, I think that you need, you should, you owe it to your organization to develop an approach, a methodology that that's yours. T take what you found of value for me today. Extract from other places. And, and be prepared with an approach. I watch people engage in crisis. And if they don't have guardrails, they just go, you know, you lose your mind. Um, and so ha just having a process, having an approach, a methodology, I think is, is fundamental. Um, super, super important to manage that chaos crisis well. Yeah. If only there was a card game out there that would allow people to do tabletop exercises ahead of time to develop a process. Maybe we should create it. No, no. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. If only. only. Yeah. Well, All let's right. Not, let's not assume people know what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we created a card game called yeah. Backdoors and Breaches, uh, which can do that for you. Okay. So if you have a question that you don't feel like it was 
answer during the webcast. And I'm guessing you do because you wanted this to go longer. And so yeah. Patterson, I'm going to reach out to you after this about what your next uh, webcast would be like, or potentially a workshop. And I don't want to like ever, like, did you ever ask your like friends, parents, if you could stay like in front of them? And then they're like, ah, oh, how did you do this? <laughs> in front? Like, like, I get it. I'm asking you in front of everyone here that I'd like you to come back and do a workshop that's potentially longer, maybe has some hands-on labs in it. And then people could actually do the thing that you're talking about, which would, I think, be super beneficial to the community. Uh, but if you had questions, feel free to ask them. And uh, <laughs> uh, so, replied. <laughs> it's almost like passive aggressive much. And I'm like, what did I say? <laughs> no, not passive aggressive. Just I like dead me. He's like group pressure applied. That's pretty much. All right. So here would go. Would you typically start, still start the dead machine captures right after you have your VR artifacts? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so, so the answer is probably not. Um, uh, again, I'll be honest that in a great many of the incident response scenarios that I've worked at the end of the day, the customer is most interested in the tactical forensics. Full box forensics are expensive. Uh, you know, we're looking at typically like a 40 hour engagement for a server. So we'll get all the way to the end again of the analysis containment eradication piece. And then we go back to the customer and say, I can get you 2% more visibility and it's going to cost you 40 hours of effort. And, and so we're very judicious about that. Um, having said that, obviously we want to make sure that that data is there if we need it. So I follow that up immediately with don't nuke it. You know, don't destroy the VM. Don't format the drive. Make sure it's there should we need to return to it. But I usually won't start unless I have a pretty clear indicator that it's patient zero, that it's where the outbreak instantiated. Great, that's a great question. Uh, what are your thoughts on right blockers when collecting your friend's forensic image you'll be working with? Mm. Wow, that's a great question. Um, my thoughts are I don't like messing with them. Um, <laughs> once again. Uh, from my perspective, for the most part, I'm, I'm responding tactically and I'm not responsible often for chain of custody and preparing for litigation. And in those instances, then they are a must. You, you, you must use those. This is just incumbent upon you. When I'm doing what I'm talking about doing right now, I, I don't often use them, uh, to be honest. Yeah. A uh, quick question for Deb. Deb, is it Gutenberg or Gutenheim? What's Guten the Gutenberg. service that? Guten yeah, Gutenberg. That might change in the future. Right now, it is Gutenberg is the yeah. certificate creation. Um, yeah. So we send an e. Uh, we send a certificate, CPE, essentially a certificate of you attending this through Gutenberg, uh, which is a service that like Zoom. It was, Zoom, the, only, it was, it was like the only one. Party. Yeah. 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 Uh, and so that gets sent to generally your spam folder. Yeah. Uh, We're working just, on it. We're and it's, solution. it is the worst phishing looking email. Like, it looks like you uh, attended a webcast. Uh, yeah, would you like here. to click this link and get your certification? I don't um, know about and that. A lot of you do and take pictures of it and share it. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, Gray Omega says, is there a cheat sheet for effort levels? This would help me with my leadership on setting timing expectations. I think that is a, know. that's a genius idea. Um <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to get back to you on that. I, uh, no, <laughs> hmm. I, I love that perspective though. I love that thought. And I think the sort of the, the cost benefit analysis of, hmm. well, if we do this, then that, that is my perspective. Again, often, you know, incident response services are expensive. They're crisis intervention. We come at a pretty steep hourly rate. We're worth every penny, of course, <laughs> But we're we're very, very judicious with your time. And so we're constantly making that mental calculation. And now I'm going to have to come up with a way to document that because I think that's genius. Um, mm. But I don't have anything for you right now. Yeah. So here's, um, here's this question is going to have some context. And it's a great question. Jordan, thank you for asking it. So when I play Backdoors and Breaches with, with clients uh, and they want to do a, the memory, they want to take a look at memory. And it's a remote system. And they're like, well, we can pull that with our EDR, like CrowdStrike or this or whatever. And I always ask, when was the last time you did that? And, and generally the answer is we never have, we just know we have the capability. 
And so that's the context I'm about to give you with this question. With the size of device RAM increasing and the endpoints being distributed all over the internet in a post-COVID remote work, work world, do you ever collect full memory captures or even targeted memory captures? Almost never. Um, oh, and that's like heresy in the, the incident response forensics community. A um, couple things about that. One, I think we can very effectively and efficiently target the indicators that are existing in memory without grabbing memory, number one. And number two, somebody already rebooted it. Uh, and nine times out of 10, the, you know, the, the volatile forensic data is gone. Uh, and I'm a cynic, that's part of my job. Um, but I, I want to target the pieces, parts. Not only that, I want to do it quickly. Capturing memory, 8 gig, 16 gig, saving it to disk, moving it through your EDR. I, I've, I've already deployed your offline collector. I've already pulled PS list. I've already pulled Netstat enriched. And those are the things I wanted out of memory anyway. Uh, long answer to a fantastic question. Um, yeah. I appreciate that. Someone's like, nothing better than rack up IR retainer hours than a 16 gig file copy. <laughs> no, kidding. no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what is the line between tactical response and when it becomes legal chain of custody needed? Boy, great question. That depends. <laughs> my, uh, again, in my experience, uh, most of what I've done is in response to an, an active threat actor engagement. So a, a malware outbreak, a ransomware outbreak, a threat actor intruding into your environment and taking unauthorized action. And in most of those cases, there will be a lawsuit, but it'll usually be a class action lawsuit. It'll usually be the customers of that organization suing them because they didn't adequately protect their data, which is entirely different than preparing for internal litigation or preparing to present my results. So from that perspective, frankly, the less information that I document, the less I put in writing, the less I present to the customer, usually with legal directly involved, often the better. Mm -hmm. So they're a huge fan of me being super tactical and, and not writing very much down. They want answers, but they don't want discoverable content that could incriminate the enterprise. Uh, so that that's where I live again, which is kind of an indirect answer to your question. Um, but I, I, I have often avoid the question of, of, uh, litigation from an internal perspective. Yeah. Uh, I, I just want to showcase, uh, now that we have this book it thing and we actually announced it and we've been doing it for a couple of weeks and we just started now, uh, I've never seen so much engagement inside discord before. Mm -hmm. So I want to just, Hey, if you're here, uh, the webcast lasts an hour, but discord just keeps going. And so yeah. there's a ton of other, uh, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of like, if you're job hunting, go to the job hunting channel and type in the word hunter, and we'll give you a special role and let you know when we're doing our job hunting live streams. Uh, but, you know, thank you so much for yeah. uh, being engaged and being a part of this. And uh, we give you the role. And so there's nothing like you have to do. And it's 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 not automated. Uh, we hate automation Jason when it comes I, to community yeah. building. Uh, well, OK. All right. All right. That's yep. yep. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, so thank you. And I'll stop sharing now. Uh, <laughs> huh. OK, I'm going to delete that one. <laughs> Uh, and just to be clear, we're not sending pizza, unfortunately. Um, we're sending other really awesome goodies, but none of it you can ingest. So, um, yeah, and we're starting like six weeks ago is when we started. So I know some of you have been here, you know, 23 times, um, but we just started it. So, yeah, we had to start somewhere. We had to start somewhere. And then there's like, hey, John, I have an idea. And John's like, what is it? And I was like, book it. And he's like, I love book it. And I was like, Okay, it's gonna be like this, and he's like, "Okay, let's get started." And I was like, All "Is right. that your John? That's weird." Yeah, that's my John. All right, so last question, Patterson. Thank you. You know, before we go, uh, in case you do need an IR service, we do provide that. Or Red Team, Thread Hunt, you know, all that stuff. Uh, but Patterson, do you recommend the offline collector being placed on endpoints before it is needed? If not, what is the best place to keep it if the device needs to be segregated off the network? That's a fantastic question. I, I have never pre-staged it and and uh, on endpoints. I like having it available, obviously for uh, for urgent deployment. 
the uh, the fact is that I update it fairly frequently, and and by fairly frequently, I mean you know, maybe a couple three times a year or something like that. So I, I don't usually pre-stage it on the endpoints themselves. I do find that in most instances there is some form of uh, of isolation exceptions in the enterprise, so that we can either pre-provision a file share or uh, uh, pre-provision the upload to your EDR so that you can then download or distribute to that endpoint. I, I like that option if it's available to you. I'm not opposed to truthfully the, the, the good old sneaker net. Uh, if and when we have to do manual hands on keyboard, copy paste, move even via USB drive, whatever. Again, backing up almost every time there's um, endpoint isolation, there's some way to get to that endpoint regardless. Um, maybe you have to pre-stage it into physical locations because you have IT help desk distributed throughout your org, some, something like that. Additionally, and I, I meant to mention this in the webcast, but I, uh, I was too slow. Um, when you do S3 offline collector, you, uh, you pre-stage, you, you choose region. So you can do US to East one, for example, for your S3 bucket. And then I um, I walk around with a list of US East one S3 IP ranges to hand to my customers. And so you can literally create that exception in your isolation program, in your EDR, whatever, so that you could not only download the collector, but you could upload the results from the collector and, and do that pretty safely because all you've exposed is, well, my S3 bucket or your S3 bucket. Uh, so just some potential options. I have one more, maybe last question. Yeah, all right, okay. let's do last. Uh, from Dan, non-webcast question for you. Favorite geek flare from the wall behind you? Patterson. Oh boy. <laughs> Are they like children? You can't like choose a favorite. It is hard. And, and, and what's more to the point is that they are legitimately mostly from my children. So it's like choosing <laughs> oh. my favorite child's oh, gift. <laughs> Because the the one above the door is my is my motorcycle. Oh, that's got to be right there at the top of the list. The mm. one above that door is a quote from Serenity. I aim to misbehave, and I know mm. those are vying in my mind. And mm. then there's the shield. I don't know. Right? That's a tough question. Yeah. And yeah. the zombie knife. We were talking yeah, about the zombie that tools. Yeah. Two zombie yeah. tools. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I can choose. Yeah. I really don't. <laughs> Well, to the 546 of you that mm -hmm. stuck around this long, wow, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate you being here. We show up because you show up, you show up because we show up. It's a vicious cycle and it's been going on for years and, and it's going to keep going on. We love it. For years. Yeah. Uh, we'll do this again next Thursday. So show up. Kelly Trella is going to talk about GRC and she's calling it the ugly sweater, like GRC, like it's because it's GRC, right? Like it's like... <laughs> GRC. Like you're cold, you need a sweater, but it's like yeah. an ugly one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if this was your first time participating in Discord, thank you. Yeah. Uh, come back next time and uh, stick around because it's got a great community. We got about 42,000 people there, about 3,000 active, about 200 active on any given day. And so if you have a question, there's probably going to be someone that helps answer it. And if you can help answer someone's question, then you get a contributor role. And what's a contributor role? Uh, we'll talk about that once you get a contributor role. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much. If you never, ever need a red team thread hunt, con continuous sock, pen testing, sock, incident sock. response, yeah. sock, you know where to find us, blackhillsinfosec.com. Patterson, thank you. We thank appreciate you. you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right, everyone. We'll see you all next time. Ryan, kill it with fire, Ryan. Kill, kill it. it. Come on, Ryan. One job. You have one job. Just...